Hello, this is David Rovix hosting another live stream broadcast, which is appearing on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Kebu Community Radio, and various other platforms. During the pandemic, since I can no longer tour and play music for a living, I've taken to interviewing people of interest most weekdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT, and doing a house concert from my living room on the last Saturday of every month at 1 p.m. Pacific, along with various other live streaming activities. Every Tuesday, the broadcast has an actual producer, longtime Detroit area talk show host and Fifth Estate Magazine editorial collective member, Peter Werby. These days, Fifth Estate is a quarterly print magazine that has been published in one form or another since its founding in 1965. You can read the entirety of the spring issue online at fifthestate.org. You can also subscribe to the print magazine there and hear various episodes of Fifth Estate Live as well. Today's guest is author, organizer, and convicted felon Anne Hansen, a contributor to Fifth Estate magazine and author of the 2018 book, Taking the Rap, Women Doing Time for Society's Crimes. She's best known perhaps for her involvement with the group's direct action and the Women's Fire Brigade, including planting a bomb in a cruise missile factory for which she received a life sentence in 1983. She speaks to us now from her home in Kingston, Ontario. Anne Hansen, so glad you could join us. Yeah, I'm honored to be uh, interviewed. And yesterday was Prisoner Justice Day in Canada, and I think there may be equivalent uh, days among political prisoners in the U.S., but I wonder if we could start with talking about what, what your day uh, occupied, what, what occupied your day yesterday. Well, we in Kingston here, it's it's the home of the old prison for women. Like in Canada, uh, from about 1935 till 2000, there was only one federal prison in Canada where people who were convicted of sentences of two years and more, women, were, were did their time. So women were shipped from all over Canada if they were convicted of a crime which had a sentence of more than two years and would spend their entire time in P4W. And there was always a lot of, um, you know, there were public inquiries and commissions and all kinds of um, investigations into, you know, abuses by the guards and um, clusters of suicides, like all kinds of what I'd say were atrocities that went on in that prison until um, around 1994, there was a, a, the final commission and they recommended the closure of the prison and, and it was closed in 2000 and they opened uh, six regional prisons for women. So we have this now defunct prison for women here in Kingston and there's a number of women who are older and we did their did time in P4W and we formed a little group here in Kingston, a collective, and decided that we would like to see a memorial garden at, 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 the, at, the, at the prison site. It's, it was an eight, eight acre compound. So it's fairly large and it's actually on prime real estate now, very, very close to the lake, right across from another notorious prison, the Kingston Penitentiary, which is right on the lake. So a developer bought it from the government and they, he, they are now in the process of um, planning to build a bunch of, on the eight acre lot, um, you know, condominiums and strip malls and everything else. So we, and they're supposed to keep at least some of the prison up due to heritage committees that have lobbied the government, right? But we would like, like I said, to see a memorial garden there for the women who died and for actually all women in who died in Canada. We, we've, we've sort of restricted it at this point to fe in the federal prisons because there's so many, but we may expand it. And um, yeah, so that's what we started off as. Uh, our main mission was to get the commitment of the developer and the city and you know various authorities to agree that we, we could have this garden and that we would be in control of it and maintain it and pay for it um but we've expanded our what we do beyond this memorial garden 
and as well, the Memorial Garden is going to be more than a place where you can go and, and remember and honor, let's say, your friends, relatives, etc. We also want it to be a site where we can educate people as to what the conditions were like there. And because um, we, we believe that the prison conditions and um, a lot of other factors, colonialism and capitalism, all contributed to their deaths. But in particular, the prison system, we, are, we also want to um, find a way to hold the, this, the Correctional Service of Canada, which I don't know in the States if it's called the Bureau of Prisons or something, but mm. we would like to hold Correctional Services of Canada accountable and the federal government um, for the deaths and, yeah. you know, in some way contribute to prison abolition. That's kind and of a long answer, I guess. It's an excellent, <laughs> excellent answer. And, uh, and who you've spent many years in Canadian prisons and you wrote a, this wonderful book, which I have only just discovered uh, this morning, but uh, the, the book, <laughs> but um, the, the uh, who, 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 how would you describe what, what would be your sort of one paragraph description or several paragraphs? Uh, who are, who are the women in uh, doing time in Canada's prisons? Well, I think I could speak for all prisoners in, in probably the Western world um, that prisoners are generally, um, I don't like using the word victims, but on a broad level, I'd say the victims of society's um, social policies, like the inequities, the injustices within our society. Like, you know, people like, especially us, you know, anarchists, radicals, revolutionaries, even progressives, uh, will you will say things like we live in a racist society. We live in a patriarchal society. We live in a society of great economic disparity. But when you look at the statistics around who is in prison, that like in the in the age of scientific evidence, right? These statistics paint a picture where it is actually true that the people that we imprison are the victims of all these policies that are you know, it, are they unjust and unequal and show that it, it, that it is definitely a racist, sexist society. Um, I'll just quickly, you know, sometimes it's boring, but in Canada, 40% of the women in prison, and you can Google this, it's not just me making up figures, 40% of the women in prison are Indigenous. And wow. only 4%, 4% of the Canadian general population are Indigenous. So that's an incredible you know, disproportionate number of Indigenous women in prison. And, and it, when it comes to men, it's it's close. It's like 30% of the men's prison population. 80% um, of the women, this is a statistic too, you could Google all of these. And it's been this statistic of 80% of the women in prison have been either sexually and or physically abused. That mm. statistic is consistent over decade after decade. So that says to you, that there's a direct relationship between women committing so-called crimes who've been sexually abused, physically abused. You know, 60% um, of the women who are in prison for murder murdered either a spouse or a partner who they had already reported to the authorities as having been abusive. So 60% of the women are in there for basically defending themselves more, you know, if you, if you want to boil it down to a simple sentence, defending themselves in some kind of, you know, domestic abuse situation. And I don't have this. OK, I think it's like, again, it's over 50 percent of the women in prison have grade eight or less. And I don't have the statistics, but I think anybody who's ever had anything to do with prisons, including guards, could tell you that the vast majority of people in prison are poor, like they come from a very poor background and uh, are just not from either the middle or upper classes. So I think if you look at the look at the demographic of people who are in prison, it's very clear that we criminalize, you know, racial the racialized segments of, of our population, and that women have, um, you know, a, a, a disproportionate are imprisoned disproportionately compared to men. Um, like right now, they're the fastest growing segment of the prison population as well. So I just, I, I guess I don't want to go on too much here, but I think that that those stats um, 
make statements like that we live in a racist, sexist society with great economic disparity, just a scientific truth, you know? A yeah, factual it's really, it, it's mm -hmm. quite a period, just the past few months are quite a period for actually seeing statistics borne out so starkly, right? I mean, mm -hmm. anybody could see like what, what the percentage, I mean, you, you, know, you, you can see if you, you know, look at the numbers, how many, the percentage of indigenous prisoners uh, compared to the percentage of indigenous in the population. You can see the same kinds of statistics in, in New Zealand and Australia and so many other countries uh, with similar dynamics, but like with the pandemic and the way it's, uh, it making like here, I think it's uh, it, it, Latino people, Latinx people are dying four times as much as uh, the general population. It's similar mm -hmm. statistics with the African American population, where how uh, anybody can have fantasies about equality and whatever ideas they have about how society is, but the statistics uh, just keep on flying in the face of any of these kinds of fantasies of. Uh, of of society yeah. being anything other than a institutionally racist, corrupt, terrible place, really. But, yeah, they're not ideological statements. Yeah, you know, um, they're and they're not just bad people. Like you know, they portray criminals in movies and stuff. These these are people that made bad choices and went in the wrong direction. But I mean, unless you believe that indigenous and black people and brown people are genetically criminally, you know, are genetically criminally disposed to be, you know, criminals, right? Which would be a very fascist ideology, then you have to come to the conclusion that it's the walls and the and the obstacles that they face in society that lead them to having to commit crime to survive. And now we have the mayor of Chicago, as I'm sure you've been following some of the news in Chicago uh, recently, and the mayor of Chicago is denouncing the many, many thousands. Uh, I guess I, I don't know if there's any clarity on the numbers, but clearly thousands of people went into the center of town to uh, smash fancy stores and uh, remove contents from them. And the mayor of Chicago is denouncing all of them. As uh, as criminals and saying that they had no political motivation and they couldn't possibly have had one and and that everything they're doing should be punished and just completely, uh, you know, no no uh, tr try no ability no attempt to sort of publicly understand, uh, you know, what was happening in any kind of more complex way than just denouncing the looters. I wonder. And you know, you know what's ironic? I was just I re I came upon this quote today. Um, just by happenstance, and it was from John F. Kennedy, and he said uh, that if you make peaceful change impossible, then you make violent revolution inevitable. I may not be quoting it exactly correctly, but that's the gist of it. And it's, you know, of course, it's ironic because I know John F. Kennedy was not was no revolutionary, but there is truth to that. Yeah, it's a. It's a powerful quote, and and it's also been said by by so many people who are not uh, advocates of, um, of 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 armed revolution or something like that, but who just uh, could see uh, the dynamics for what they are. And Martin Luther King also made similar uh, comments on the mm -hmm. uprisings, many different uprisings. But it's this is uh, I know I'm conscious of not wanting to violate your terms of uh, probation just to like, let's not go anywhere that's not uh, that might be risky. But this is a huge uh, thing in, in the it's it's all over the news all the time here, mm -hmm. all, you know, about the whole question of, of violence and nonviolence and, and the and what constitutes violence, what constitutes nonviolence, who are the actual looters, who's looting who? Uh, you know, of exactly. course, when the banks are bailed out and we, for trillions and trillions of dollars of tax money and and because they were totally corrupt uh, and then they don't have to pay the consequences. But the rest of the world does. And they but and no, nobody goes to prison for that. And, then, and nobody's called a looter. Uh, you know, it's the biggest kind of looting you could possibly imagine. And uh, 
yeah, where is the condemnation of those uh, criminals? But but yeah. this is this is the debate, right? I mean, and then Black Lives Matter Chicago showed up this morning, I believe, um, outside of the prison where uh, people were at the jail, where people were being released uh, on on bail or whatever, um, and they had a a, a sign uh, that that basically spoke to that basic idea that you know who are who, 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 as long as there's enough inequality then you know keep on looting basically i said I'm, I'm paraphrasing but yeah it's kind of sometimes it's a, like a silent oppression and eventually the frustration of being held captive to this extreme poverty you know people they have every right you know like to go out and loot in that but like for example i have to talk about canada in a sense because i'm not so familiar with examples in the states but we have a public broadcaster kind of like you have pbs we have, we have the cbc and they did this um survey where they sent out generic um employ like they um employment like requests for employment and the and the references were generic so each one was identical, the same, they had the same qualification, same education. The only thing that was different in each application was the name. So there, they had people who were named, um, let's say, Ricky Rodriguez or um, Mohammed Hassan, and then Susie Brown or Ann Smith. So as it turns out, almost none of the applicants who had very clearly racialized names didn't even get an interview, sight unseen. Whereas the people who had clearly white names, you know, obtained interviews. Like that's how racism works, right? It's a sort of mm. often, it's a very, it can be a very silent thing. So of course, you know, it's very difficult for black people, Arab people, indigenous people to get jobs, even sight unseen, simply by submitting an application with their name on it, you know, or maybe yep. their neighborhood, or maybe on the phone call, the dialect that they use from their neighborhood, right? And in prison, they have, I don't know, it's probably true in states too. They when you apply for passes and parole, you have, to, you know, you go to your parole officer and they you fill out, they fill out all these forms and they have these these things that have been developed in, in through criminology departments called crimogenic factors. So that the decision of whether you get parole or passes is based on this sort of um, system of uh, answers to these questions. And there are things like whether or not you come from a one parent or two parent family, whether there's people who are addicted in your family, what neighborhood or what area, like whether you're from a reserve, let's say, or whether you're not. And so as it turns out, like people who come from one parent families where addictions are present and who have, let's say, not a university education, each one of those answers will be given a number. And so it turns out that black people, again, indigenous people score very low. And so without even evaluating their behavior in prison, they will be denied passes and parole because they do very poorly based on these so-called crimogenic factors, right? Like this is, I think, the subtle ways that racism works in our society. And that was just two examples from like prison and applying for jobs. And so no wonder people, you know, like, of course, the pot's going to boil over eventually. And that's what's happening. There is no yeah. peaceful means of changing our society. What's been it what's it been like? And I mean, I, as things are falling apart in the U.S. in so many ways and the unemployment money ran out at the end of July and, and uh, many people are just falling off of a economic cliff. People have been tens of millions of people haven't paid rent in months and the moratorium on evictions is going to end soon and, or is ending in many, depending on the state. I mean, it's, it's really like a sort of a, just a, 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 a pretty crazy situation or perhaps a ripe situation for organizing. You could, there's another way to look at it, but what's, what's been, I mean, it, I know there's it's inevitable there's like people always are making comparisons between how things are going in Canada and how things are going here and and I think many people here are like jealous of the better uh, organized uh, situation in Canada but uh, as as many uh, and of course 
you know, your, I, I mean, I wonder, do you, do you get that a lot from any communication with people in the U S where they're always like, Oh, you're so lucky up there. Things are going uh, much better. And uh, there's always these comparisons being made. I don't know if that's a, a reality as much when you're actually living North of the border as opposed in to terms uh, of the COVID virus, you mean? Yeah, in Are terms of COVID to... response as, as well as, uh, as, as I think it's also a general sort of uh, thing where uh, in, in politicians in Canada can often point the finger south and say, look, we're doing fine. Look at look what a mess it is down uh, south of the border. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing things so much better. And uh, also left wingers in the United States. I think Michael Moore most famously is constantly making movies <laughs> about how uh, things in Canada are better, you know, which I mean, in so many ways they are, but uh, which it's all it's all relative uh, you know mm -hmm. I, I just wonder well, if that's something you come across much well i think people here in canada you know you go to the states and and, and i must say if you drive through the areas in new york or detroit where the poorest neighborhoods i mean they are in terms of degrees worse than what you see in canada i mean there is definitely extreme areas like it like again, indigenous reserves, um, I can't, I don't know the, the percentage off the top of my head right now, but it's a large, large percentage of reserves do not have clean drinking water. They have to boil water, you know, um, and their, their level, they, you know, their access to education, usually they have to, you know, at very at a very young age, fly into the cities, into cities away from their families, their communities to go to school. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that are wrong with Canada. Uh, I think to some degree, people, I think like Michael Moore may be right. There is, if you're looking at things subtly, it's true. I think Canada has a little bit more of um, sort of social, the social policies are a little better. You know, we have healthcare, government healthcare. It's been being chipped away at constantly though. I mean, I don't have to worry if I have to go to the hospital, I don't have to pay for it. You know, that's a huge thing. And I think our welfare system is probably better. But uh, ultimately, we still live in a capitalist society, you know, that it still has, you know, all the things I was talking about earlier. Um, I think the number of people in prison per capita is probably lower, but not significantly lower, you know. So, I don't know. We don't One of we the don't things here, but <laughs> the wilderness is what's left of it. But, you know, it's constantly being... Um, I think becoming more and more Americanized Canada. Yeah, and also uh, uh, speaking of Americanized, the uh, the influence of the U.S. military industrial complex is so pervasive in Canada mm -hmm. and other NATO countries. I was just involved a few months ago with uh, blockading the entrance of Raytheon in in Germany, and in, in uh, where they have a, a part a factory that produces uh, missile parts, and they um, the it, the seven hundred billion dollar annual military budget we have in the U.S. Of course, there's a lot of other companies in other countries that are producing parts for the all these. Uh, I mean, it's it's one big happy family, isn't it? In yeah. terms of uh, NATO and yeah, that's uh, I think and, and as well as Sweden, incidentally, and per capita uh, uh, in, uh, exports, I believe, more uh, military hardware than any other country in the world. They don't get you don't hear about it much because it's mm -hmm. relatively small numbers. But Canada is yeah. also a big exporter of uh, of weapons of war as well. Yeah. Yeah. And our resources, you know, Canada's main, uh, I guess, our main um the most important segment of our, our economy for capitalists is the um, re natural resources, you know, minerals, oil, uh, the for you know, lumber. And um, most of those co large companies are American based, American owned. So, you know, it's basically the um, American corporations that own Canada, you know, even though the government may run it, it's essentially owned by the uh, by American companies. And the Chinese are moving in too, you know, and uh, European companies. But essentially, the American—I don't have statistics around this—but I think it's it's pretty well yeah. known that that's yeah. that's true. And I mean, back in the day in the eighties, I mean, the Lytton plant that we bombed was because Canada 
that's where it was in an American company, Linton Systems, and they were producing the guidance system for the cruise missile. And at the time, Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's father, was the prime minister. And he'd always said that we were not going to have any part to play in, in the testing of the cruise missile. And then, I don't know, somewhere behind the, the scenes, things changed because he tried to convince the Canadian public that it was part of our role in NATO to test that we were, you know, obligated to test the cruise missile as partners in, in the North American tr treaty organization. So, um, you know, we were, they, we tested the cruise missiles out at Cold Lake Air Force Base. Um, and Trudeau, like, because Trudeau can, you know, perpetuated this lie that people believe, whereas apparently the cruise missile was not uh, it wasn't cla wasn't actually classified as a weapon under under the NATO treaty. Trudeau was trying to kind of walk some kind of line, like pretend that Canada was sort of like a neutral country or something, whilst being a member of NATO. Was that yeah. the kind of thing? It, well, it reminds me of what they were like in Ireland when they you got the the U.S. warplanes refueling at Shannon uh, Air Airport, um, but then Ireland claims to be a neutral country and it's not part of NATO, and it's like kind of like. You know, you can't really have it both ways. Like I could, I could, I, I sort of assume that Trudeau himself was opposed to that at the time. You know, the cruise missile was a new weapon, and I think he was opposed to the idea of it. But then reality kicked in. This is what I'm assuming happened. And behind the scenes, he put, was there was probably a tremendous amount of pressure applied to him to be part of the. You know, like like a, like Lytton was going to make build the cruise in Toronto. And out in Alberta, the Cold Lake Air Force Base was going to test it. And he obviously gave in because if you wanted to study his past statements, he was critical of the cruise missile and, and just the just, you know, atomic weapons in general as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you are listening to Fifth Estate Live, which comes to you every Tuesday on various platforms, including the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance and KBU Community Radio. You can find all the episodes archived in audio form at fifthestate.org, where you can also subscribe to the Fifth Estate print magazine. We're talking with author, organizer, and convicted felon, Anne Hansen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like being able to call people convicted felons whenever I get the chance, you know. Yeah, that is it's funny. It has a nice Should ring. Like that printed up on it. <laughs> We're all felons. <laughs> We're all felons if we've done anything useful in life. Uh, yeah, you know, that's right. The 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 decision like I mean the the various sort of um elements that go into deciding to take some kind of an action. Like I'm thinking of a um, friend uh, who just was until recently uh, lived here in, in uh, Portland, who um, uh, Brian Wilson, who, when there was a, uh, uh, arms uh, shipment coming through on a train in California at some, I think it was in 80, was in the eighties, right? 84. Uh, when, and he, he was one of the folks who laid down on the tracks and, and had his legs uh, cut off by the train at, at, because it, they didn't stop. Uh, wow. it, but uh, you know, th these kinds of, these kinds of decisions that people make to do something that is, that 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 is clearly like gonna get them in kind of potentially massive trouble like dead or mm -hmm. or in prison but then uh you know it's historically the things that actually have changed the world have been social movements that have committed lots of very illegal activities mm -hmm. uh you know it's it's i mean it's it's not it's not elections that have tended to uh uh, change society generally. I would I would mm -hmm. say is is fairly uh, clear. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, don't know. I mean, I'm getting old, but I I think that the key is to have is that for people to embrace the diversity of tactics. You know, like to have I. I think if you study any revolution, it's never one specific kind of tactic that actually works. I think it it were things you you get you know revolutions or like large like social like large social change when you actually when there is a variety and and a real like you know mass movement with willing to engage in, in all the various tactics 
But, you know, the best thing is if, if they're unified by um, an analysis or an, 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 uh, politics or even ideology that is revolutionary, you know. Um, but, you know, you have all kinds of people like single mothers with children. You can't expect them to necessarily choose to, to, to go to prison, you know. Um, perhaps people are, are old and, and sick. So, or, or there are people who just don't have, like, you know, they don't, they, they just don't have the nerve, they don't want to end up in prison and for whatever reason. But there's still a lot of things that need to be, that are just as, as, as legitimate and as, and as strong as that, you know, like example, Fifth Estate, you know, you need the newspapers, uh, you need the people organizing in the streets, you like those massive demonstrations in Hong Kong. It's really too bad that they, I, I, I got the impression that they're fairly pro capitalism, but I mean, just the idea of being able to mobilize millions of people. I mean, mm. what better yeah. way would there be? But then you also have to have um, an alter, and you also have to have an alternative community that can move in to take to to take into the into the into the void that once the existing government or economy begins to collapse, if there's nothing to go to move into that void and take over, that's when you can get foreign countries moving, you know, getting their military in and taking over, or fascist groups taking over, or you know, so th I think you, you know, you need these alternative uh, communities as well within society that are always working and, and developing that alternative society so that if, if capitalism does start to crumble and the power structures that, that make it, that make it up, um, if you have that alternative communities, be, you know, that are actually in place, then you're more likely to succeed, you know, and actually it, the outcome will be good it, as opposed to just, uh, you know, some other form of oppressive society. Do you see That's those what? alternative communities being built in, in particular places, in particular ways? Is it something that's uh, on, on your radar as far as those kinds of communities or mutual aid networks or anything like that? Well, Kingston's a, a pretty small city, really, but we do have um, alternative communities that have social centers and, um, you know, we have collective um, little coffee shops and people who were, who st well, the, the whole harm reduction community started off with the alternative community organizing it, you know, leftist doctors and activists riding around on bicycles, distributing, you know, for needle exchanges and this sort of thing. But yeah, in Kingston, we do have, an, a, you know, it's small, but a significant alternative community. And I'm sure in the States, you guys too, do too, don't you? I mean, yeah, we, uh, sure. We can never belittle the, the various tactics and strategies, as long as they are, you know, based, again, on a revolutionary goal and analysis and value system, you know? One of the things that always uh, strikes me about some about all of the big protests that are happening in Portland and other cities as well is, uh, is there's always uh, or or usually a, a bunch of different groups that are doing various things like responsible for medic uh, responsibilities or or cooking and distributing food or different uh, of course prison uh, prison support legal observers often and then it's a you know relatively self-organized kind of thing people decide to be involved with one collective uh, or another that's carrying out the responsibility. It's, it reminds me also of uh, during the general strikes on, in, in the various uh, general strikes historically, there's always uh, people taking on these responsibilities when the whole city is shut down. There's still people transporting, uh, delivering the milk in the milk trucks and stuff. I mean, that was one of the strike uh, committees, uh, deliver milk delivery. But, yeah. Uh, one of the biggest dangers, though, I like when I'm talking about, you know, the harm reduction community, like drug addiction and that, it's mm. a good example of how, like, when it started out, like I said, you know, you had these progressive doctors, you had addicts who were re recovering addicts who were delivering needles. That's how it all started, right? But as time has gone on, capitalism is very good at recuperating movements, you know? or even alternative communities. Because I think the harm reduction community is a really good example, at least here in Canada. Um, because 
I was I, I was struggling with an opiate addiction when I got out of prison. And mm. I only was able to, to, to actually, that would, that's a, that would be a whole other interview. But at any rate, um, so when they- we, we got a little time. <laughs> yeah. So when, they, when, they, when the harm reduction community began to emerge, right? Mm -hmm. And methadone became available. Like to me, it was like a miracle. It saved my life. I tried so many different things to quit using opiates, you know, treatment mm. sent withdrawal, going to my mom's, you know, all these things, none of them work. And and what was it that did work? Part, uh, well, methadone. Methadone. Yes. I have to say for me, it worked. And for a lot of people, like it's, it's very, very difficult to just go cold Turkey um, yeah. from a, like a drugs, like heroin. And back in the day, that was the main thing. Heroin and fentanyl wasn't even around, but as time went on, um, you know, the it, you know, the government got involved and at first that seemed good. You know, we had these government run clinics where they provided methadone treat, you know, so you could go and get it and you hardly paid anything here in Canada, the, you know, our healthcare system paid for it. Mm. And I, and, and, you know, like literally hundreds of thousands of opiate addicts got on methadone and no longer had to run around committing crimes to get their daily fix. And I think my own, I haven't done any research on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's why the crime rate has been going steadily down for about yeah. 20 years. And it does coincide with the beginning of the whole harm reduction program. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Nineties. So I don't have any, any proof of that, but I, I think it'd be an interesting thing to study. But now we've reached this point in time where then I think so the government started, you know, I think it, this is probably how it emerged in the states, too. You have government run um, health clinics where they provide, you know, methadone, various harm reduction programs, you know, clean needles and all this sort of thing. And then I think the pharmaceutical companies kind of woke up like, like, wow, you know, methadone is super cheap. And look at how much of this sh shit we're selling. And here in Kingston. The original little storefront government funded harm reduction place, which was called the, the Montreal Street Health Clinic, is now this huge building, several stories high. And I think they have, you know, over 250 clients. But there's another four or five places in town that are run by private companies, you know, and it's really, you know, you can get method on quite easily now. Um, and we kind of call the myth method on clinics, like hmm. McDonald, you know, and um, it's very easy to get on. I mean, I, I don't want to be critical here of them having lax criteria for getting on method on, but, you know, and at the same time, the main drugs that people are addicted to now are not heroin, but are hmm. pharmaceutical drugs, you know, fentanyl. Uh, Percocets, like all these kind of drugs that somehow make it onto the street, but are produced by the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, if you want to sort of start simplifying it, like they're they're, they're sort of capitalizing on both ends of the addiction spectrum. You know, they're providing the illegal drugs inadvertently, maybe, and the whole the access to methadone has become very huge. You know, like I'm sure if you looked into it in Detroit like the um, harm reduction clinics and the amount of methadone that is being distributed is huge, you know? Mm. So I think the big winner in this, to some degree, of course, addicts are, you know, that they can, that they have this drug that really works. But on the other hand, the pharmaceutical companies must be just raking in the dough on both ends. Right. Yeah. And that's that so interesting on so many ends. There's so many different sort of ways to look at that equation in terms of like, who's, uh, I mean, it is so many, in so many ways, it's the society that produces so much addiction in the first place and then criminalizes people for being addicts and then profits off of yeah. <laughs> the addiction yeah, at the same time. Scheme. Brilliant. You know, for sure. uh, what an amazing scheme. You got it all covered on every possible angle. You'll make money it, if you're a corporation. And it seems very kind. Like, for example, you can go in there and if you, it, this is, I don't go to a private clinic, but it doesn't matter. There's so many of them. But from what I'm, I know, you know, a, yeah, a person 21, let's say, and has a dirt, you, you have to give them a urine sample to get on methadone, right? But I think it's become very easy to get on methadone. So you take some Percocets, um, 
and go in there with a dirty piss test and you're on methadone, you know, and methadone is, is really also an opiate. It's very strong. It's nothing is ever, it's ever black and white. Like methadone mm -hmm. is a, a life-saving drug. I am not the least bit critical of it being available. But on the other hand, if it's too easily available, it is very hard to get off methadone as well. You know, mm -hmm. it's very strong drug. It takes sometimes years to slowly taper off. But at any rate, it's my cell phone going off. Like I have it set for snooze, which I don't. Uh huh. <laughs> but then there's those exceptions, people that can get through the snooze. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I guess I don't want you to, to lose the point of this is that um, the alter back to alternative communities. So this all started mm. off with the alternative community trying to help addicts, uh, realizing that it's not simply say nope to dope, like Nancy Reagan said. Like when you're a drug addict mm. of cocaine or heroin, unless you've been an addict, it is extremely difficult to, to, to quit. You know, like I had no history of sexual, physical abuse. I had came from, a like if you're old like me, you'll know what I'm referencing here when I say leave it to beaver. I grew up in a family like leave it to beaver show, you know, it was actually really as good as you can get. So I have got any of those stereotypical past. I don't have a stereotypical past. You could say prison, right? But for whatever reason, I was, um, my, my brain chemistry just seemed to click with, with opiates and I felt really great and functional. And that was the only thing that worked for me. But like I said, cat, you, it, it, when you're developing alternative communities, if you're not, if you don't have a really strong revolutionary analysis that it's rooted in and have a very clear revolutionary goal, it's very easy. Like capitalism is brilliant at recuperating. Right. Like I still respect Colin Kaepernick, but it is kind of bizarre how he became a spokesman for Nike. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's another Such brilliant move. Take Colin Kaepernick, right? And you know, somehow there he is now, spokesperson for Nike, you know? Yeah, a, a company that em employs that children Nike. to, what's that? No, oh, I'm I'm, I'm commenting more on Nike than I am being critical. I don't want to get on Colin Kaepernick's case, right? Yeah, but he's... but Nike is, I mean, when you're, when you're uh, taking corporate sponsorship, then there's some, you have some relationship with this corporation. And it, it is, must be said that they employ teenagers to make their uh, shoes in Indonesia. And I believe that's still the case. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's say even in the Black Lives Matter movement, I, who am I to make, to, to give advice, but. I think everyone has to be very careful that, you know, um, that the black, that the movement around racism doesn't somehow get recuperated now by the, by the corporations, you know? Yeah. It, it's, there's always that, uh, th that tendency and, and we see how much uh, so many of the movements from the sixties, they tried to incorporate into the, their, their business model and, and to sort of neuter them. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And do you have any uh, particular predictions for the next few months uh, in Canada or anywhere else in the world? And it's an incredibly volatile period. And I just uh, I wonder, I don't know how much you're like a, a global news junkie. Or, and even if you are, it's still too much going on to try to take in. But I mean, last year there were there were rebellions going on, really seriously large rebellions going on in, in multiple countries. I mean, in terms of massive numbers of people on the streets every day in places like Lebanon and Chile and Algeria. And, and then uh, there's all the developments of the past few months during the pandemic. And I don't know if uh, you're seeing any particular trajectories or anything or, or how much you're focusing on just what's going on there in Kingston or in Ontario around, uh, around the sort of uh, fault lines exposed in society by the pandemic. But I just wonder what your thoughts are on life under the pandemic and the next few months and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I guess what concerns me is um, as much as the coronavirus is something to be concerned about, it seems to me that when, when our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, you know, gets on the radio every day talking about the COVID virus and what they're going to do, and then at the same time, he's building more pipelines. Now, what is more of a threat? you know, global warming where you have, I don't know, I think it's 15, I could be wrong again here, 15,000 scientists 
um, um, who, who <clears throat> excuse me, put, put together statements for the United Nations saying, you know, within 10 years, if we don't do something radical, <clears throat> that climate change will become irreversible. And it's catastrophic. Um, and, and why? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just can't even listen to the, to the politicians about the coronavirus when they have so little. Well, like when at the same time, they're building pipelines and doing nothing about global warming. You know, it's, it's not that to say that we should not give a shit about, you know, the coronavirus. But um, when it, it's, it's kind of like, to me, like in one room, again, this is a bit of a metaphor, you know, you have somebody who's been, who's bleeding out, you know, they've, they've, they've had their arm slashed, so they're literally bleeding out. And in the other room, you have someone who has like a very serious, um, let's say flu, right? And I'm not again, equating the coronavirus with the average flu, but still, and they, they're, they're very sick. So the, so the doctors are going, you're going, well, I got to go in there and do something about this guy that's bleeding out. And the doctor's going, no, 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 forget about it. We got to deal with this flu because we could all catch it. I mean, you know what I'm saying here? I just mm -hmm. think it, it, it's, it bothers me that they are so quick to react, relatively speaking, to the coronavirus and yet absolutely are doing nothing about global warming. Like there's been no drop in the carbon, carbon dioxide emissions, you know? They say, but what's what's kind of uh, it kind of opens up the the uh, possibilities for what governments could do in the face of global warming because so many governments have taken such drastic action to try to deal with this virus and they've mm -hmm. taken such massive economic hits in order to uh, mount these lockdowns and everything. And uh, what could they do if they wanted to actually solve other uh, bigger? Uh, problems like uh, climate change yeah that's what i see happening too and it, and i mean it's very politicized this you know the eco economic shutdown again i'll use kingston here as an example um it'll sound a little bourgeois but i was looking for some colored ceramic tiles and uh so in the beginning of the coronavirus i went to home depot which you're familiar with big american company they were open still you know, you could walk around and deal with the clerks and go get in the lineup. But right from the beginning, when they didn't have any colored tiles, I went to the local flooring stores, which are more family owned, small proprietor stores. They were, there was, I think there's in Kingston, small, there were only three. They were all shut down with one of those, you know, um, sort of uh, Xeroxed government forms saying that they had to be closed until such and such a date due to the coronavirus, but not Home Depot, Rona, or Lowe's. And then as the, 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 the pandemic progressed, um, yes, the Home Depot and Rona and Lowe's closed, but they still had their online uh, shopping available, which they had already in place. Whereas none of the small stores were, had had online shopping to begin with and don't have the money to set it up rapidly like that. So, and I don't know, there's some, some things I don't have statistics to back up because I wasn't prepared to talk about this, but I have heard that some of these big chain stores like Home Depot have been making quite, like their profits have not gone down in some cases because, you know, they've got pretty much, um, you know, yeah. people are still shopping through online yeah. shop. And then, you know, if it continues for two or three years, like they say, I think that that would be good for the big store, the big chain stores, because they, if they could have more and more online shopping, they need fewer bricks and mortar stores, which are much more expensive to maintain and with all mm. the staff involved. So, you know, when they say they're clo like they're closing down the economy, that's not exactly accurate. Like they're closing down all the small, you know, all the little family restaurants, family bars, but McDonald's and Tim Hortons are still open you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, and uh, all these big pain stores are still open. So I'm, I, I, I can't help but, you know, shake my head. And here yeah. in Kingston, there's been, um, very, well, we've had very few deaths, actually. But in Ontario, there's been an awful lot of people in the long-term care facilities, in particular the privately run ones that have died. But it's exposed, 
that the private long-term care facilities didn't even have, in many, many cases, isolation rooms. And even before the coronavirus, you know, there's been the pneumonia is a, is a very typical right. way for people to die. So it exposed as well, you know, how with our older people, how we don't really, you know, put any, have regulations for these long-term care facilities to protect old people. Yes, the coronavirus. Although I'll bet the ones that the wealthy old people go to, the the ones the wealthy old people, the ones the the wealthy old people go to, I'll bet they have more uh, facilities. That's probably true. Yes, yes. So it has exposed, I think, a lot of the. You know, that's the thing. The mass media doesn't talk about that, like how it's really brought out the disparity in society. You know, like if you see pictures, they talk a lot about how many people have died of the coronavirus in Brazil, or even in the states, right? And, but if you see pictures of the surrounding areas of large cities in Brazil, like we're talking tar paper shacks, right? Like miles and miles, like very, very poor. When you talk about poverty, real poverty. So of course they can't, they can't use social distancing or if they are selling fruit for a living, you know what I mean? So the poor people are the ones that are dying, you know, and they can't even um, apply these kind of things like social distancing and masks and not working in, in places where people are that poor. And I'm sure that's true in the States as well. Yeah. And it's also been a problem uh, is in Canada with the essential workers uh, dying much more as well with the bus drivers and different folks. I, I heard from a bus driver in Alberta who was uh, talking about that situation couple months yeah. ago. Import, personal support workers are notoriously underpaid and are also quite often racialized people as well. And they're always putting, like the government has taken out ads thanking them, but not increasing. Well, they did increase their wages for for a, a period here due to the coronavirus, but there's For a no, while, right? But yeah, and but there's then, no... And then they lowered it again. Yeah, that's right. Like So I don't think, there's no guarantee that they're going to have a better wage, you know? So yeah. like I would say, it's sort of like indigenous people when you talk about reconciliation, like I would say, you know, don't be sorry, give us back our land. You know what I mean? Right. Or in terms of pers personal support workers, I'd rather be paid a, a good wage than be called a hero and haven't, and you haven't even got enough money, you know, to buy a home. Yeah, and you're, yeah. And, you can work on your implicit bias all you want, but how about actually paying us? It's like indigenous people. It's kind of like if somebody came and took over your house with, with a, an armed raid, right? They took over your house, kicked you and your wife and your children out. And then let's say 10, and you're living in a shack in the backyard because they've got all the money and the weapons. And then maybe 10 years down the line or something, the home, the people that took your home have a little bit of a, you know, a, a conflict of conscience, you know, and they come out there and they go, you know what, that was wrong what we did to you, kicking you out like that. I'm, You know what, I can't believe we did it. We are so sorry. And then turn around, walk back, shut the door and continue living in your house. You know, that's what, that's what to me, this whole yeah, truth here in Canada, truth and reconciliation or in the yeah. States. When I think Obama, didn't he apologize to Indigenous people for all kinds Somebody of things? Somebody did. I can't. There have been a few apologies, and they're just so empty. What? What is this apology? And if it's not I mean, coming with any kind of back their land, I mean, that's what people right? want. They want their land, at least some of it back, right? But anyways, right. I wish I had more a more positive message to, or more positive things to say about the world today. Well. There's, uh, you know, we can, we can, after we build a more positive world, then we'll have more positive things to say about it. I mean, you can always comment on the beauty of the, the, the latest rainbow, but it's uh, kind of when, when there's, when there's a uh, carnage going on all around you, the rainbow seems like maybe less uh, notable. You know? Yeah. I think there's a lot of great people out there that are struggling. And that's often when you develop the, the best relationships, you know, when you are, organizing and working together and doing the right thing you know and for some bizarre reason people i find like in prison or indigenous people often have the best sense of humor too <laughs> right you know 
maybe that's the only way sometimes to deal with like what appears to be it futile a futile situation you know sometimes yeah. you have to laugh as well as struggle right yeah absolutely and i i've definitely made that observation also about like uh, the the sort of his, most historically oppressed corners of europe like in ireland uh, it's also where you find the best humor or or among uh yeah, the, the the poorest parts of just Rome, and I mean, it's it's really a, a, a consistent thing with this uh, the gallows humor, the sort of bleak, dark humor of of people that are, yeah, that you know that maybe, that uh, the house, uh, what's that? Maybe they see more, like yeah, maybe they see more deeply or something. With you know, like the more you suffer, the more layers you you know you may be exposed to in life, right? But I know yeah. you're right, indigenous people. We just lost the audio all of a sudden. Now, what happened there? I don't know what's going on. The audio just vanished. Let's see. Ah, you're, you're uh, muted. Your mic is muted, and somehow. I don't know why. What happened with the muted mic? But we, are, ah, there you go. Oh, we, you, we were back for a second there and then you went away again. I don't know why. Oh, there, oh, there we are. There we are. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I haven't touched a my ghost, in the, in the a last ghost hour. in the machine. Yes. Yeah. Well, there is a storm brewing outside. Maybe that has, uh -huh. I don't know. Yeah. There's a storm oh, brewing oh. outside my window. So <laughs> that could be doing it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, the the little uh, uh, story about the uh, people in the house who come out and apologize and then go back in their house uh, would make a fantastic children's book. I just have to say, if uh, somebody out there needs to turn that into a good children's book, because uh, yeah, uh, and yeah. how do they get that house back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that could be very well. Good. It is, I guess, it's exciting, right? Like, I'm trying to, I'm, you know, what I'm, I'm kind of like thinking about this whole interview, and it sounds really like, oh God, you know, I'm, I should go just kill myself or something. But I mean, in the states, especially right now, I mean, it must be heartening to see like so many people out on the streets organize right. and protesting against racism, right? Like, that is a positive, right. isn't it? Right, and as it is, bad as said. police brutality and uh, everything else is, there's a lot of response going on, and that's uh, yeah, very positive. Yeah, definitely. What's really depressing is when there's no response, right? When it just goes right. on month after month, and people get beaten down and nothing. So that and, that is something to be happy about. And is there any any of that kind of uh, organizing going on? Is is you're seeing a lot of that kind of response in Canada, or is the two thousand dollars a month that most people are getting keeping people kind of calm and quiet? Oh no, there, there's a, the Black Lives Matter is alive and well in Canada too. Yes, there's been well, most recently there's been like protests about events that are, again prison related, like a man. Uh, he was a, a he was a, a Muslim man, and he had suffered from schizophrenia. Another sad story here, but I guess uh, something happened in the community where he, uh, someone felt threatened. So they called the cops um, and they took him to prison and he was handcuffed. His legs were shackled. He had a, they call it a spit screen over his face. They tasered him and five guards beat him to death. Mm. And this, well, it happened about a, a little, like about a year ago or so, but they just had uh, the results of a public inquiry. And they found that they could not find, they could not determine which guard delivered the fatal blow. So that hmm. they were all exonerated. Uh. Another unhappy story. So, you know, we've, there's been protests about that recently. But for sure, we have Black Lives Matter here. An Indigenous protest group called Idle No More as well. And, yeah. you know, so the same thing's going on here as in the States. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, la luta continua, as they say yes. in yes. Latin. <laughs> Great talking to you, Anne. Yeah, it was, I, I would have liked to have asked you some questions. But anyways, thank you very much. <laughs> well, but I'm the one asking the questions. I'll be on your show another time. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, Thanks so bye much, bye. Anne. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
And thanks everybody for joining, uh, tuning into this discussion with Anne Hansen in Kingston, Ontario for Fifth Estate Live, which you can hear every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, KBU Community Radio, and elsewhere. You'll find all the Fifth Estate Live episodes at fifthestate.org, where you can also subscribe to the physical magazine or read the latest edition online. You can also find these interviews and my other interviews archived in various places in the discussions with David playlist at youtube.com slash drovix and in audio form at uh, soundcloud.com slash david rovix at patreon.com slash david rovix where you can also support my broadcasting efforts and check out lots of other content or if you look for this week with david rovix on any podcasting platform if you're somewhere in the region of Portland, Oregon, please go to artistsforrentcontrol.org and sign up for text notifications to be part of Portland Emergency Eviction Response to help us mobilize against the coming waves of evictions. I've got a crowdfunder for an album project going, also known as a musician and audio engineer employment scheme. You can check that out at davidrovics.com slash pandemic sessions. Remember, don't pay the rent and don't be afraid of your neighbors. Mutual aid will get us through. See you soon. Bye for now.